Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us in this session. Um, the Read All About It project that Kath and I have been working on for some time uh, is a collaboration between the Australian National University and James Cook University and the National Library of Australia, uh, building on uh, the to-be-continued to database of historical Australian newspaper fiction that uh, that Kath and um, uh, that Carol Heather and Carol Hetherington has uh, worked on for some time before that, from 2018. Um, it speaks to the conference theme, what we're doing today, of embellishment in two key ways. First, our work to expand the record of 20th century Australian newspaper fiction embellishes in the sense of adding to Australia's literary and print culture history. In particular, the fiction discovered in the project will enable insights into aspects of this history that will have, until now, escaped attention due to the canonical and book-based emphasis of scholarship. The second mode of embellishment, uh, which incorporates the additive as well as the transformational implications of that term, arises from our work to enhance the existing uh, crowdsourcing affordances of TBC with editing, publishing and curating practices. With the uh, participatory literary history, we thus seek to enable, uh, we aim to encourage and explore ways of reiterating or remixing historical fiction and of writing back to the archive. We're far from making any conclusions about the data we've collected so far, and yet to begin work on facilitating participatory literary history. But with this paper, we'll re report on the status of the project and consider the implications for the study and practice of Australian bibliography and literary and publishing history of these three, of these different embellishments. Um, Kath will begin by discussing the origins of the pro project and where we are at present. I'll take over for a few minutes to discuss some of the authors and texts that are emerging from our bibliographical inquiries. Kath will then discuss the crowdsourcing affordances of the database, including the collaborative digital editing platform we're building. And then I'll conclude with the notion of participatory literary history and some of our plans for how the editorial platform might foster and facilitate this practice in regional areas and also in classrooms. Thanks, Roger. So, To Be Continued combines 19th and 21st century textual technologies to explore newspaper fiction in Australia in the 19th and 20th centuries. So the 19th century technology is the newspaper, including consistencies in the paratexts of these publications, which makes it possible to identify fiction by searching for words such as tell and sketches, our novelist, and the most successful one, chapter. The 21st century technology is the National Library of Australia's Trove database, including its mass digitization of historical newspapers and its API for, or application programming interface for exporting these records at scale. And there you have the input, um, excluding the digitized text of one search result for this API process. So transforming these results into usable bibliographical information requires a lot of work. And thankfully, ARC funding has enabled the great good fortune for this project of having Carol Hetherington, um, an expert bibliographer, work on the curation of these records. Um, though Roger will now attest that I've, I've roped him into it, that there's plenty of data entry for everyone involved. It's not only limited to Carol. So in 2018, when we made the database public for the first time, it had approximately 21,200 publications in it. So that charts a, a little snapshot of the records in TBC in 2018. Context, a record is a publication, so a story in a newspaper, and that might be completed in a single issue of a newspaper, or it might run across scores of newspapers, but scores of issues, sorry, or even across hundreds. Um, in some cases, a work is only present in the database in a single record, and at other times, reprintings of the same work mean that it's present multiple times. And these stories include both popular and literary fiction by Australian and international authors. So British and American authors are really prevalent, but we've also got um, authors from much further afield. So the other British colonies of the 19th century, such as Canada, New Zealand, and South Africa, as well as works in translation from the French, German, Italian, the Japanese, and, and much more. <clears throat> 
So a substantial number of these publications are also by authors who, despite our best bibliographical efforts, we haven't been able to identify. So from this first part of the project, when we launched in 2018, there were two unexpected things. First was um, that there were really a lot of previously unrecorded Australian works in the newspapers. So a recent comparison I did of the 19th century Australian novels in Auslit and in, in To Be Continued showed that there was very little overlap between the two. And in fact, that the To Be Continued um, records double the number of 19th century Australian novels that we're aware of. So we've, to return to the theme, we've substantially embellished um, that bibliographical record for the 19th century by doubling it. So a second unexpected outcome of this first part of the project was the scale of the 20th century fiction. So I'd assumed that newspaper fiction publication would decline rapidly in the 1890s as expensive multi-volume editions gave way to cheap paperbacks and that it would cease effectively in the 20th century, um, as has been argued was the case in other Anglophone publishing contexts. So that straight line you can see just tucking up on the your right, um, reflects that assumption that I had, not the records in the database. So basically we did a single search for the period of the 19th century up to 1914. Me hoping to demonstrate this decline and disappearance. In fact, we found so many records that we realized we would just have to concentrate on the 19th century and leave the 20th century to another time. So luckily um, new funding has made possible this exploration of the 20th century newspaper fiction um, and also to do some development on the database that I'll discuss. So Roger, Carol and I have been working on indexing this 20th century Australian newspaper fiction for the last year and a half. And that's where the um, To Be Continued database is today as of the 22nd of November in terms of the number of records in our original up to 1914. And if I move back and forward between the two, you can see that we've added a bit there. Um, but what we've done is only get through the results of a single search for the first decade of the 20th century, and we're sort of halfway through the, the search, the first one for the second decade of the 20th century, so there's a lot to go. Um, so here's all the records in to be continued now comparing the um, where they were in 2018 and where we are today. Um, and we now have over 37,000 records in the database. So I'll come back to this graph. Um, after Roger talks a bit to talk a bit about some of the crowdsourcing work that the projects already involved, but Roger's first going to tell you some of what we've already found with the early 20th century newspaper fiction. Yes, and I can attest that there is a lot of uh, a lot of indexing and uh, work to be done. Um, as Cass shown in her uh, previous uh, work in a world of fiction. Uh, Australian fiction, including Australian novels, were much more prominent in Australian newspapers in the 19th century than previous literary history had shown. Although we've only begun exploring the early 20th century fiction, our preliminary invest investigations suggest a literary culture or cultures different to previous accounts, which is, have largely been book-based and canonically focused. Two trends are especially prominent and interesting to us. First, that freelancing and amateur writing played a substantial role in Australian literary culture in this uh, time that we're looking at. And second, that there was no one Australian literary culture. Instead, unique regional cultures influenced literary circulation. These aspects of newspaper fiction publishing suggest much more diverse Australian reading and writing cultures than have been recognized previously, shaped by print cultural and economic forces that extend far beyond major cities, publishers, and authors. In indexing the 20th century uh, newspaper fiction that I've been doing so far, I can see that this authorship and publishing context intersects quite significantly with that of 20th century magazine culture, including authors who emerge prominent in both. So some authors that uh, many of you will be familiar with um, that work at this inter intersection are people like Vance Palmer, Catherine Susanna Pritchard are starting to show up in uh, the newspapers. Uh, Roy Bridges and, and many others. Others including less known and forgotten names are beginning to feature in a field that is otherwise sparse of Australian writers. Uh, the complaints about syndication that uh, become louder in the 1920s and 1930s are so far muted as the work of uh, prolific writers from England and America, such as Richard Marsh, 
William Lequeux, Lady Trowbridge, Nick Carter, Max Pemberton, and others. They're filling the spreadsheets that I've been working on and in conversation that I have with Kath and Carol, they're on their spreadsheets as well. This situation presents a challenge to a project that aims to foster and facilitate participatory literary history beyond the major cities. And so I've been looking at uh, looking forward to uh, later decades of the 20th century to determine ways in which engagement with citizen editors might be achieved. In the 1920s, editors began, uh, editors of newspapers and magazines began to provide more opportunities for Australian authors to see their short stories, serial novels published in Australian periodicals. A new generation of editors and writers provided encouragement and advice in publications such as Why Editors Regret, First Aid for the Freelance, uh, followed by a series of similar publications in the 1930s and 1940s. Press the right button. Um, that were filled with advice from experienced writers, information about the newspapers and magazines that were looking for content, along with the range of pay for various items, including short stories and serials. The Australian School of Journalism also stepped into the breach, luring amateurs and aspiring journalists to supplement their income with or making a living from freelance writing. One of the questions we might ask is whether these initiatives had any effect. Did it lead to a democratization of writing similar to what Chris Hilliard examines in his book To Exercise Our Talents? Where does somebody like uh, Lyndon Grierson, oh, there she is, a dubbo housewife who sat at a typewriter at night at the end of the day's work writing romance novels, many of which, which were serialized in Australian newspapers before they were published overseas? How does somebody like that fit in this history? We have a lot of work to do before we can formulate an answer to that question, but asking it enables speculative searching that identifies examples of regional and remote writers who might be of interest to local historians and ultimately be well served by engagement with local history groups or museums in order to enhance or provoke a broader understanding of the literary and print culture that supported them. Okay, so on to the more participatory parts of the database. Um, so before discussing the way we're trying to extend the database in this direction, let me just say a little bit about the existing forms of crowdsourcing that the To Be Continued database supports. So I don't know if you can see that very clearly, but this is the, the landing page for the database and you can see the, the buttons on the bottom of the screen the type of um, crowdsourcing activities we have. So people can search for titles and authors so they can explore, as that says, they can correct, they can add, or they can export. So this is the, the actual um, interface of the database. There's the URL. Anyone, you know, of course, is free to go and have a look. If they find someone that they, they want to read, they can, they can read the, the text in the database or in the newspaper archive um, in Trove. If they're reading in Trove, they can use the text correction facilities there. And when, when they're done, they can draw the text back into the database to improve the searchability of Trove and to be continued. They can add chapters that were missed in our original harvesting of the um, stories. And they can also enter, that's how you add a chapter. They can also create entirely new titles in the database. So that brings them to a place where they can enter some bibliographical data. Has anyone been doing this? Well, if I take you back to that graph I showed you earlier, then the difference between the records in TBC in 2018, the blue, and today, the red, well, most of the stuff in the first two decades of the 20th century is me, Roger, and Carol. But if you have a look at the slight growth in the 19th century, and especially this long trail of records into the 20th century up until the 1970s and 80s, then that's the crowdsourcing activity. So who are these people and what motivates them? Well, I was new to crowdsourcing in 2018, so I didn't think to create mechanisms to record what people were doing. Um, but I know from considering the records for the 1920s and 30s and from some emails I get, um, that people are focused on adding things that they're interested in. So for instance, in the 1920s and 30s, two provincial uh, New South Wales newspapers are really prominent, the Armadale Express and the Lithgow Mercury. 
And some people have also focused on adding particular authors. So I know from emails that someone's added Agatha Christie, someone else has added Henry Lawson. Um, but in the 1920s and 30s, the two most prominent authors in the database are actually two Australian women writers that I'd never heard of. Um, even though they're in Auslit, but there's been no criticism of them. And that's Ethel Marta with 65 publications and Hilda Bridge, Bridges with 177. So people are working away in the database. So our turn to participatory literary history for this new project is an attempt to try and encourage, expand and explore this interest in the crowdsourcing community in, in doing literary history by creating a collaborative digital editing platform. So with, the C, with this CDE, we love acronyms in TDC, um, with the CDE, our aim is to create opportunities for members of the public to embellish the literary histor historical record by creating their own editions with newspaper fiction. So this diagram is um, just a schematic to show you what the database will enable. So you can do the things you're already able to do, which is add records and correct the text. Um, but um, once you've found something you're interested in, you can um, create a collection. Um, you can grab some, you can do some searches, grab some records, and then you can create a collection of whatever text you're interested in. So maybe you're interested in a particular author's work, or maybe you're interested in a particular title, perhaps a canonical one, perhaps not. Um, but maybe you're interested in some different type of um, arrangement than we typically look at uh, in literary history. So maybe you're interested in writing about your hometown, or maybe you're interested in stories about um, canoes. And um, so whatever it is that interests you will be um, grabbed at this collection, collection stage. And you can do um, editing in free text format. And then you can create these draft editions, which can be published and, sorry, they can be published and um, made public, but they can also be deposited in, into the National Library of Australia's collections. So um, you might have, for instance, a, an, a Bloomsbury edition of Henry Lawson alongside a new to be continued crowdsourcing edition. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to Roger now to talk about um, the theoretical implications, if you like, of this participatory framework. Yep. I've been following the time too, and I can see the signal coming from down there. So I'm just going to scoot through this last bit. To foster public engagement in 2023, uh, I'll be reaching out to various local history groups in far north Queensland in order to introduce them to the project and engage them with a few writers in their stories and invite them to test the database and editing tools that we've developed. Um, uh, 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 Cheryl Taylor's uh, provided a start in here with uh, writers like Nancy Francis, whose Queensland Queensland Luck was serialised. Oh, I'm pressing the wrong button. Uh, in the uh, Cairns Northern Herald, due to her profile as an essay, essay poet and her long career as a correspondent, the Cairns Post from Rossville and Herberton, much is known about Nancy Francis, but there are other writers such as uh, Mary Gr Guthrie, who is unknown uh, as well, um, who also provides uh, local uh, stories for local historians to work with. Another plan uh, for 2023 is uh, one that Kath is leading, which will explore, explore integrating the TVC into tertiary classrooms um, in providing a structured space in which students can explore Trove add records to a database, conduct bibliographical research, correct text, and then edit it with an outcome deposited in the National Library, as Kath showed. So in the spirit of Amanda Gailey's vision of defiant computing, localized small-scale editing projects might prompt renewed attention on non-canonical, overlooked, radical histories. The Read All About It project will enable small communities of amateur and professional literary historians to discover and edit newspaper fiction and produce digital editions that reiterate or remix historical publications. 